<clears throat> Greetings and happy 119th birthday reclamation. My name is Rob Manning and I'm the Chief of Public Affairs here at Reclamation. We have a full agenda for you today that includes brief opening remarks by Deputy Commissioner Tootin, followed by the kickoff of our history series leading up to our 120th birthday next year. What an exciting milestone. Some admin notes. <clears throat> we'll conduct a brief question and answer period following the history presentation. Please feel free to submit your question in the chat anytime during the presentation and our producer will read your question and Dr. Gahan will address it at that time. This event is being recorded, so please uh, take that into consideration if you choose to participate. At this time, I am honored to welcome our Deputy Commissioner, Camille Kalimlim Tutin. Boy, I hope she's here. Thank you, Rob, and good morning. Happy birthday, Bureau of Reclamation. Our history is an integral part of our American history, and I'm honored to celebrate another milestone year with you as we continue to advance our rich legacy together. Thank you for joining us to recognize the 119 years of professional excellence and kick off our efforts to inform, educate, and celebrate our 120th birthday next year. Today, we celebrate our service to the American people, providing water and power to the West since 1902. Over the past few months, I've had the opportunity to connect with many of you, and I am constantly humbled by the deep expertise and talent across the Reclamation team, and I look forward to meeting you in person soon. You are a part of a rich legacy of Americans renowned for harnessing cutting edge technology and that inspired our nation through the Great Depression and continues to help sustain the life and livelihood of the American West. We are also kicking off our year long campaign to show showcase how our can do spirit has kept reclamation at the forefront of modern engineering for the past 119 years. Our focus is to highlight our rich history through a year long series of present presentations and other initiatives that explore reclamation's vital role in the West, <clears throat> informing our workforce and building public awareness leading up to our 120th anniversary. Thank you to Dr. Andrew Gahan for kicking us off today by discussing reclamation's key challenges between 1929 and 1945. It is a mon monumental period for reclamation that is framed by the Great Depression and World War II and includes the awe-inspiring construction of Hoover and Grand Coulee Dams. As we have a true historian in Western history to guide us through this discussion, Dr. Gahan received his PhD in history from the University of Nevada, Reno. As a uh, running rebel, Dr. Gahan, we will make this exception to the wolf pack. He was selected as a reclamation historian in 2013, and he is expertly designing our history program to capture and showcase our rich history. You will hear much more about the monthly topics and initiatives to showcase our diverse history and inspire awareness of our continued obligation to the American West. Thank you for your commitment to address our challenges and, and advance our legacy together. Happy birthday, Bureau of Reclamation. 119th never looks so good. Thank you and back to you, Rob. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Tootin, and thank you for your leadership. It makes all the difference. As Deputy Commissioner Tootin said, Reclamation history is baked into American history, and we should be very proud of that. And equally as deliberate with the treasure and the immense responsibility that we've been entrusted to advance. Renowned poet Maya Angelou once said, I have great respect for the past. If you don't know where you have come from, you don't know where you are going. Powerful words, powerful words that stress the importance of knowledge. 
knowledge in order to build on the success of the past and not repeat mistakes in the future. Historical insight is priceless. So we designed a monthly history series to share our rich legacy and build awareness as we celebrate our 120th birthday next June. Today's presentation focuses on reclamation from 1928 to 1945, a critical period in our history and a critical period in American history. And our presentation in July is focused on women in reclamation. We will also showcase our longstanding and, and internationally renowned partnerships. And we're still finalizing this schedule and encourage all to support, participate, and celebrate our history of professional excellence. At this time, I am excited to introduce Dr. Andrew Gahan to kick off our year-long history series. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Gahan's deep expertise in Western history. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to welcome our reclamation historian, Dr. Andrew Gahan. Thank you, Mr. Manning, very much for that lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to be here again as we continue our discussion of Reclamation's history. If you were with us last time, and this is just a reminder, we examined Reclamation's creation and growing pains up to the passage of the Boulder Canyon Project Act in 1928. As Rob mentioned today, we will discuss your reclamation activities during the Great Depression and World War II and the influence of those events, those events had on the transformation of reclamation's mission. So let's begin. Next slide, please. The Great Depression and World War II right up there with the Civil War as the most dramatic and transformative events in United States history. Their effects reverberate throughout American thought and culture up to the present day. For the Bureau of Reclamation, the period from 1929 to 1945 would forever change the agency's mission. Reclamation activities would redefine water resources development in the West, viewing projects on a river basin scale, making hydropower production an integral piece of program planning and lessening the importance of homesteading. Next slide. By the end of 1928, the fortunes of the Bureau of Reclamation looked bright. On December 21st, 1928, Congress had passed the Boulder Canyon Project Act, by far the largest and most challenging project to date. During the late 1920s, Reclamation's construction regiment remained robust, but still under the governing policy sprung forth from the Reclamation Act of 1902. With the completion of the construction of Gibson Dam on the Sun River Project, Echo Dam on the Weber River Project, and Oahe Dam on the Oahe Project. Next slide. Now, Oahe Dam played an important role in the construction of Hoover Dam. The 410 foot high gravity arch dam allowed reclamation engineers to work out some of the construction challenges they would face in constructing Hoover especially the tricky issue of concrete cooling. Owahi Dam also had the short-lived notoriety of being the highest concrete dam in the world when completed in 1932. Next slide. As I mentioned last time we met, one cannot overstate the importance of the Boulder Canyon project for the Bureau of Reclamation. It was the first project funded solely through congressional op appropriations. The Reclamation Fund, as conceived by the authors of the 1902 Reclamation Act, was simply unable, unable to handle a project of this magnitude. Next slide. By 1929, Congress was beginning to recognize that water development in the American West was changing and required novel solutions. Supplying water for only irrigated agriculture failed to keep up with the West's growing needs. The development of hydropower and water for M&I purposes offered a panacea of many of Reclamation's funding and feasibility problems. More importantly, expanding the benefits derived from federal water, water projects would keep up with the region's changing social and economic conditions. Next slide. Thus, the Boulder Canyon project initiated fundamental shifts on the planning and operations of water projects. Benefits were expanded to embrace 
a wider range of beneficiaries and purposes. Project goals included non-irrigation aspects like power production, where revenues would offset construction costs, flood control, a non-reimbursable benefit, and water for M&I, and eventually recreation. Multipurpose entered Reclamation's vocabulary and proved to be very popular with the public and Congress. Next slide. As we all perhaps recognize, flood control had always been a part of Reclamation projects. Facilities such as Theodore Roosevelt Dam on the Salt River Project and Arrow Rock Dam on the Boise Project brought some measure of protection against flooding. Also, flood control had always been viewed as a government responsibility. Annual rivers and harbor legis legislation bore witness to that federal responsibility. But reclamation water users never received full credit of this benefit. And the Boulder Canyon Project Act attempted to rectify that omission. Next slide. The same could be said of power development, which was always seen as a project feature that benefited both reclamation and water users. Yet there was no unifying policy on how to achieve the best results from that benefit. The Boulder Canyon Project Act defined the role of hydropower in relations to the project's overall goals. With the expected output from the Hoover Power Plant, reclamation began its role as one of the nation's leading producers of electricity. Next slide. And finally, the Boulder Canyon Project Act expended, expanded the federal government's role in Western water management. The Secretary of the Interior through reclamation essentially became the Lower Colorado River Water Master. Hoover Dam was seen at the time and still is an integral part of the Colorado River Compact. In, in, um, in issues such as water storage and overseeing basin allotments. Next slide, please. The construction of Hoover Dam solidified Reclamation's reputation as one of the world's premier engineering organizations. Reclamation engineers designed and planned the world's highest dam, overcoming challenges never before encountered. The Bureau of Reclamation proved highly efficient in coordinating one of the greatest engineering feats of its time. Next slide. Reclamation engineers resolved numerous technical issues which required the development of new construction techniques. The gravity arch design strengthened the dam against the extreme pressures of holding back one of the world's largest human-made reservoirs in Lake Mead. And Reclamation worked out controlling the frequently unpredictable flows of the Colorado River. Next slide. The scale of the construction of Hoover Dam tested the Bureau of Reclamation's management abilities. Reclamation worked closely with the general contractors hired to construct the dam, such as six companies and others, developing procedures and practices that allowed for the steady and continuous movement of men and materials. The construction of Hoover Dam proved a shining example of engineering efficiency and aesthetics. Next slide. And at the same time, they built a modern state-of-the-art city to house the army of workers who worked on the dam, a practice reclamation would continue throughout the rest of the century. Next slide. The Bureau of Reclamation understood that the eyes of the entire country would be following Hoover Dam's construction. Indeed, the construction site became a tourist destination. And Reclamation designed the dam to be not only functional, but aesthetically pleasing. Reclamation hired renowned architect Gordon Kaufman, who is credited with the Art Deco design of the dam and power plant. This effort also included the influence of artists Alan Tuper True and sculptor Oscar J. W. Hansen. And Hoover Dam became a showpiece of the abilities of the Bureau of Reclamation and eventually an American cultural icon. Next slide. Construction of Hoover Dam coincided with the start of the Great Depression and the stock market crash on October 24, 1929. The economic stagnation would last until 1941 and Americans entrance into the Second World War. Next slide. One casualty of the Great Depression 
was the reputation and legacy of Herbert Hoover, who was elected president in 1928. Hoover's connection to reclamation and water development in the American West began in 1922. As a Secretary of Commerce, he represented the federal government during the Colorado River Compact negotiations. And from that time on, Hoover was a supporter of the Boulder Canyon project and reclamation named the large dam in Black Canyon in his honor. Within a year after taking office, the United States entered the worst economic depression in the nation's history. And by 1932, many Americans would blame him for not, for not doing enough to stem the effects of the Great Depression. Next slide. As the depression worsened, hundreds of unemployed workers, some with families, flocked to the Colorado River, all looking for employment on Hoover Dam. They established an itinerant community referred to as Ragtown on the river's banks, which had no running water except for that in the river and no sanitary facilities. It is uncertain how many of these individuals ever found work at Hoover, but their willingness to endure extreme deprivation in the canyons of the Colorado River represents the intense stress many American working class families were suffering under. Next slide. In November of 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected president of the United States. Roosevelt promised to turn the tide of the Great Depression and the return of prosperity. Next slide. Roosevelt's administration readily appropriated the Boulder Canyon project to provide publicity of New Deal efforts of putting Americans back to work. And as a side note, in an act of political pettiness, Secretary of the Interior Harold Ickes renamed to Hoover Dam, Boulder Dam. In 1947, President Harry Truman would change the name back. Next slide. Now throughout the depression, water resources development projects were a particular focus of New Deal planners to stimulate local economies and generate employment, such as the creation of the Tennessee Valley Authority and the construction of Norris Dam along with the Army Corps of Engineers construction of Bonneville Dam on the Columbia River and Fort Peck Dam on the Missouri River in Montana. Next slide. New Deal programs also gave life to state water projects imagined, discussed, and debated for decades. In, in the state of Washington, visionaries proposed a huge dam near an ancient coulee along the Columbia River that would create an agricultural and industrial empire. Californians had long thought a huge plumbing system that would distribute water evenly throughout the state. And farmers on the Rocky Mountains Front Range of Colorado enviously eyed the unused and wasted water flowing down the state's west slopes in the hopes of capturing that resource for their thirsty farms. Next slide. The Bureau of Reclamation's success at Boulder Dam revealed an agency capable of taking on large, ambitious projects. The Boulder Canyon Project Act became a blueprint on making such projects economically feasible. These were multiple purpose projects that the nation would support, providing jobs for thousands of workers, spurring industrial production to supply construction material, and having the means to repay the federal government through the development of electricity. Next slide. Legend has it that a group of boosters in Wenatchee, Washington, conceived of a plan to build a large dam on the Columbia River near the ancient Grand Coulee. In their vision, they foresaw a hydroelectric plant that would not only pump Columbia River water to irrigate it 1 million acres of North Central Washington, but also provide enough hydropower to industrialize the entire Inland Empire. Next slide. And during the 1920s, there were intense debates within the state of Washington over the project's feasibility. Some argued that there was no market for all the power the dam would produce and offered other schemes. And initially, reclamation officials steered clear of the debate, concerned with the projected cost. But Roosevelt's election in 1932 encouraged both project supporters and reclamation that a dam at Grand Coulee could become a reality. And in 1933, FDR authorized the allotment of Public Works Administration funds to construct Grand Coulee Dam. 
The Bureau of Reclamation would oversee construction and project development. Next slide. In December of 1935, the first concrete was poured, and for the next six years, it never stopped. Construction of Grand Coulee Dam mirrored practices established for the Hoover Dam project. Contractor consortiums were hired for construction, while Reclamation planned, designed, and inspected every aspect of development. Next slide. By early 1941, the last bucket of concrete on Grand Coulee Dam was poured. With the threat of war in the air, increased efforts were made to bring the power plant online. And on January 1st, 1942, Reclamation began operations of the dam. Any actions on development of the project's irrigation phase would have to wait until the end of the war. Next slide. In 1919, a former geological survey engineer named Robert Bradford Marshall proposed a plan to water all of California, which became known as the Marshall Plan. Marshall's scheme called for a large dam on the Sacramento River with two aqueducts running along the east and west sides of the Sacramento and San Joaquin Valleys. The plan would provide water for farms, cities, and produce electricity. Next slide. In 1931, a modified version of the plan was proposed by the state engineer, and in 1935, the state legislature passed a $170 million bond issue for construction. Because of the depression, the state was unable to sell the bonds and turned to the federal government for help. Next slide. In 1935, FDR authorized construction of the Central Valley Project under the Emergency Relief Appropriations Act. But final authorization did not occur until the 1937 Rivers and Harbors Act. And in 1938, Reclamation began construction of Shasta Dam on the Sacramento River in Northern California. Next slide. At the beginning of the 20th century, discussions in Colorado began of a plan to divert Colorado River water to the Front Range. However, it was not until 1935 that thir surveys began to establish the project's feasibility. The proposal called for raising the level of Grand Lake and the construction of a tunnel to send Colorado River water to the Big Thompson River. Next slide. Almost immediately, opposition to the project arose. The National Park Service expressed concerns that the project would mar the scenery of the newly created Rocky Mountain National Park. In addition, communities in Colorado's West Slope protested the taking of Colorado River water that might hamper their future development. Eventually, both parties were appeased with the promise that all construction would occur outside park boundaries, in this case, under the park, and Reclamation would build Green Mountain Dam and Reservoir as compensation storage for West Slope concerns. Next slide. In 1937, FDR authorized construction of the Colorado Big Thompson Project with funding from the Department of the Interior Appropriations Act. In October of 1938, construction of Green Mountain Dam began and in June of 1940, work started on the 13-mile-long Alva B. Adams Tunnel under Rocky Mountain National Park. And the following year, construction of Ga Granby Dam commenced. Next slide. The development of these four projects had a profound impact on the Bureau of Reclamation. They emerged as the outgrowth of dreams and ambitions of local and statewide boosters. The sheer size of these projects implied some form of federal assistance, but the Great Depression and New Deal goals to rejuvenate the economy laid them on Reclamation's lap. But there were concessions. The 160-acre land rule was removed in the Imperial Valley and on the Colorado Big Thompson Project. Next slide. These particular projects remain incredibly important to the Bureau of Reclamation. They represent about 40% of the irrigated acreage supplied by Reclamation. And with the exception of the Columbia Basin Project, all these projects had deep-rooted agricultural communities before Reclamation became involved. These were not settlement or homemaking projects of the past, but projects designed to aid well-established agricultural areas. 
and all retained a heavy reliance on the production of hydroelectric power to offset construction costs. Next slide. It did not take long for politicians to realize that political capital could be gained by supporting these programs. And overall, these activities were very popular with the public. For reclamation, its activities during the Great Depression did, what, did much to polish its once tarnished reputation with water, user, water users and Congress. And during the Depression, Congress authorized over 35 projects. Next slide. But the homemaking rhetoric appeared to lessen as a greater voice was given for, mul for multi-purpose projects. Next slide. One New Deal program that proved incredibly popular with the public was the Civilian Conservation Corps. This enlightened program provided employment for men between the ages of 18 and 25 to work on natural resources projects in the nation's national forests, national parks, and even reclamation projects. The program ran from 1933 to 1942, and more than 2.5 million men participated, working in 4,500 camps throughout the nation. Next slide. In 1934, the Bureau of Reclamation was allotted nine CCC camps, and the first camp was opened at Lake Guernsey on the North Platte project. Now, some of these early camps were established to provide drought relief, such as on the North Platte project in Nebraska, the Belfouge project in South Dakota, the Carlsbad and Rio Grande projects in New Mexico, and the Strawberry Valley and San Pete projects in Utah. And by 1935, the CCC camps assigned to reclamation peaked at 45. Next slide. Compared with other government agencies, reclamation's allotment of CCC camps was relatively low. Nevertheless, these young men made valuable contributions to reclamation's construction and maintenance programs. They constructed recreational improvements at Alamogordo Dam in New Mexico, rebuilt the service road leading to the Gunnison Tunnel River portal, and raised Clear Lake Dam on the Klamath Project three feet. Next slide. CCC enroll enrollees also performed important services to keep reclamation facilities running smoothly and efficiently. They cleaned and cleared canals, replaced wood structures with those made of cement, eradicated weeds and rodents, and cleared reservoir areas. And as war, clou war clouds loomed on the horizons, the CCC applicants moved to expanding war industries throughout the nation. Next slide. Despite exciting new opportunities and reclamation's increased construction program, there was distress on reclamation farms, which was severe. Drought and falling pr crop prices plagued irrigators throughout much of the 1930s. As a result, reclamation farmers found it increasingly difficult to repay their construction charges. And between 1933 and 1936, Congress offered relief to project farmers by passing consecutive moratoriums on construction charges. But these did little to rectify the situation. Next slide. Now, as I mentioned in our last discussion, reclamation water users and farmers throughout the nation had been struggling with decreasing markets and rising overhead costs since the end of the First World War. Congress had also been wrestling with the issue of repayments and attempted many solutions such as the Reclamation Extension Act of 1914 and the 1924 Fact Finders Act. Next slide. But the Bureau, but the Boulder Canyon Project Act offered possible, possible solutions to this long running dilemma. Reclamation officials, congressmen, and water users recognized that compo components of multi-purpose projects could stabilize the economics of irrigated agriculture. Expanding project benefits and deferring the cost of some of those benefits would ease the water user's burden. At the same time, providing water and power for M&I purposes would greatly aid the West economic growth and prosperity. Next slide. And on August 14, 1939, Congress passed the Reclamation Project Act of 1939 to address issues regarding repayment contracts 
distribution of benefits de derived from power generation and future project planning. The act was a major reform of the reclamation program and changed the course of Western water development. Next slide. In November of 1940, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected to an unprecedented third term. FDR's focus had turned to the war in Europe and increasing disputes with the Japanese Empire. Although still facing strong isolationist sentiments, he discreetly maneuvered both American industry and the public onto a war footing. For the Bureau of Reclamation, this meant increasing difficulties in supplying construction materials, and some reclamation contractors were seeing more and more workers headed to more lucrative war industry jobs. Next slide. On December 7th, 1941, the United States entered World War II. For the Bureau of Reclamation, the war would have a profound impacts. Reclamation's construction program at the time was running at full tilt. Next slide. The generators at Grand Coulee Power Plant were coming online, ready to send electricity to war industries in the Pacific Northwest. Next slide. Construction of Shasta Dam in Northern, in Northern California would continue throughout the war because its potential power production was determined essential to the war effort. Next slide. However, work on the Colorado Big Thompson project in Colorado was not so fortunate. Despite efforts by Coloradans who argued for continued construction, work was halted or extremely slowed down for the duration of the war. Next slide. In general, most reclamations construction activities either slowed down or stopped unless it was deemed essential to the war effort, such as the production of food and fiber or the generation of electricity for war industries, which is why, as I mentioned earlier, work on Shasta Dam continued. The war also affected personnel as many reclamation employees either volunteered for service or were drafted. Next slide. One of the fallouts of the attack on Pearl Harbor was increased anxiety from fears of a Japanese invasion on the West Coast. Governor, government officials at all levels tightened security around all facilities that contributed to the war, efforts, war effort. And this reaction also resulted in increased security around reclamation facilities. Next slide. Now I can't discuss reclamation during World War II without mentioning FDR, exe, FDR's Executive Order 9066 that resulted in the internment of Japanese Americans. Much has been written and discussed about this blemish on American history. My goal here is to attempt to show reclamation's co connection, albeit ta tangentially, to this event. Anti-Asian sentiment had been expressed in the American West since the California Gold Rush. It came into full bloom as a national concern with the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. The reflection of those prejudices was written into Section 4 of the 1902 Reclamation Act that prohibited the employment of quote unquote Mongolian labor. And Congress did not remove this clause from the Reclamation Act until 1956. Next slide. During World War II, manpower shortages affected the ability of project farmers to secure agricultural labor and some reclamation contractors to find workers. Congress thought to ease these scarcities by allowing, quote, services or labor of, labor of prisoners of war, enemy aliens, and American-born Japanese who are under the control of the federal government may be utilized in the construction, operation, and maintenance of federal reclamation projects, end quote. And this was written into the 1943 Interior Appropriations Act. The, langu the language was necessarily specific so as not to violate the 1902 Reclamation Act. And thus Japanese internees worked on various project farms and in particular for a short time as construction workers on Anderson Ranch Dam in Idaho. Next slide. And as I already mentioned, and most folks are probably unaware of this law, also included German and Italian POWs and conscientious objectors. Next slide, please. 
And as a side note, the lack of agricultural labor also led to an agreement between the United States and Mexico that allowed Mexican laborers to work on American farms under the Bracero program, which ended in 1964. Next slide. Despite the war, there were non-military, international, and domestic matters that concerned reclamation. On February 3, 1944, the United States and Mexico signed the Mexican Water Treaty and Protocol. The agreement determined the rights of both countries to the allocation and utilization of the waters of the Colorado, Rio Grande, and Tijuana Rivers. Its effects on reclamation were considerable regarding the operations of the Rio Grande Project in New Mexico and the Boulder Canyon Project on the Lower Colorado River. The treaty also determined Mexico's allocation to Colorado River water, which the Colorado River Compact had recognized and required reclamation to construct Davis Dam to facilitate water deliveries to Mexico. Next slide. Moreover, with war restrictions limiting the construction program, the Bureau of Reclamation took the opportunity to start looking at the post-war West concerning water resources development. For instance, on March 10, 1943, Congress passed the Columbia Basin Project Act, which authorized the construction of an irrigation facility to irrigate an estimated 1 million acres. And although development would not begin until the end of the war, Reclamation conducted some of its most detailed and comprehensive land studies to date. Somewhat reminiscent of the homesteading days of the Reclamation Service, this would be the largest single land opening in Reclamation history. Next slide. The most far-reaching change that came to Reclamation was the reorganization in 1943. Reclamation established seven autonomous regional offices based primarily within the West's most prominent river basins. This would permit the agency to have a greater interaction and a more intimate relationship with water users. The independence of the regional offices realigned the decision-making process throughout Reclamation, lessening the influence of the Chief Engineer's Office in Denver. Next slide. Regionalization of Reclamation's organizational structure fit well with what the agency had been attempting to accomplish throughout the 1930s. Focused on an entire river base and permitted planners and designers to view water projects as pieces of an integrated whole. Legislative authority, such as the Reclamation Project Act of 1939, provided the means to establish project feasibilities under new parameters. Multipurpose became the benchmark for project development and opened a path for the future. Next slide. The best example of the early effects of regionalization was the Pick Sloan Missouri Basin Program. This was an all encompassing plan to develop the entire Missouri River Basin. It was a joint effort between Reclamation and the United States Army Corps of Engineers. The Corps would construct flood control facilities and maintain navigation along the main stem of the Missouri River. While, rec while Reclamation was tasked with irrigation and power development along the Missouri's primary tributaries. Some observers at the time noted the oddity in the cooperation of two competing agencies in the development of this project and referred to it as a quote unquote shotgun marriage. This partnership was a pragmatic response born out of an FDR threat to create a TVA-like Missouri Basin Authority, which would have left out both agencies of any basin development. Next slide. On April 12, 1945, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, the nation's longest sitting president, died in Warm Springs, Georgia. In less than a month, Germany surrendered and the war ended in Europe. It would take another four months and two atomic bombs before Jap Japan surrendered on October 14, 1945. FDR had led the nation through the worst economic disaster in its history and the world's most devastating war. Both events under Roosevelt's leadership had transformed the Bureau of Reclamation. While it is difficult to discern Roosevelt's attachment to Reclamation's programs, New Deal goals of stimulating the economy 
and development of public works programs provided employment to provide employment fit well with reclamation's overall mission. More importantly, the Depression and World War brought opportunities for new and innovative ideas on government functions and how it could best serve the American people. Next slide. At the end of the war, many had recognized the contributions reclamation facilities had made to the war effort, especially Hoover and Grand Coulee Dams. Next slide. Hydropower produced at these facilities helped to run West Coast airplane factories and shipyards. And next slide. In addition, power from Grand Coulee was sent to the Manhattan Projects reactors at Hanford, Washington, that produced the plutonium used in the atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki, which eventually led, as I mentioned, to the Japanese surrender. Next slide. The Great Depression and the World War completely transformed the mission of the Bureau of Reclamation. The West that Reclamation served was much more urbanized and industrialized, and the work conducted during that relatively brief 16-year period reflected that change. While providing water for irrigators remained and would remain an important aspect of Reclamation's tasks, the character of Western water development had expanded. The agency was no longer dependent upon the Reclamation Fund and the sale of public, public lands to move forward. Congress and the American people recognized the value of Reclamation projects to the social and economic prosperity of the West when not tied to the archaic ideals of settlement and homemaking. Along with agriculture, water for power and m and purposes became equal considerations and reclamation service to the American West, a pathway it would follow for the rest of the 20th century. Thank you so much for listening. That's pretty much all I have now, um, but I think I will go ahead. If you guys have any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. Okay, at this time, we will conduct a brief question and answer period. Please submit your questions and the producer or we the questions while Dr. Gahan addresses them as time permits. The first question we have, M&I purposes, what is that term? Um, M&I purposes means municipal and industrial purposes. Um, basically, in, in, I think in its most simplistic form, it just means being able to su supply waters um, to cities and industries, uh, which wasn't necessarily a full-blown reclamation function uh, before basically the, the Boulder Canyon Project Act. Thank you. Okay, next question. I believe Hoover Dam has a memorial to the workers who died building it. I believe Grand Coulee Dam does not have one. Do you know why? <laughs> well, I know Hoover does have a memorial to uh, the workers who died at the, at the dam. Um, to be perfectly honest, I didn't know that Grand Coulee didn't. <laughs> so um, I can't really give you an answer of why that did not occur. Thank you. Okay, and then uh, during this time period, did other countries observe the success of these reclamation projects and launch similar large hydro projects? Um, well, I do know, and I think that's gonna be coming up in one of our later presentations, but I do know that during this period, uh, reclamation was um, visited. Uh, an encouraged visitation by other engineers from all over the world who were studying what reclamation was doing, uh, what type of projects they were they were providing. Um, indeed, during the war, uh, reclamation was advising um, or looking into the Chinese government's plans um, to construct basically what turned out to be the Three Gorges project. Um, so reclamation during this time um, really had um, I think a rather large and substantial um, relationship uh, with the international community. 
um, who were looking at reclamation uh, for advice um, and just to see what we were doing and how they could um, uh, transfer those that knowledge um, to works in their countries. Um, but as to individual prop, uh, projects outside the United States, um, like I said, other than investigations of the Three Gorges Dam project, um, I can't really uh, think of anything offhand. Thank you. Okay. How is Reclamation Fund used today? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, to my knowledge, my understanding, it's not hardly used at all. Um, reclamation still relies primarily, I believe, um, and I could have this wrong and maybe the deputy commissioner could <laughs> correct me on this. <laughs> uh, reclamation still relies on um, uh, congressional appropriations to conduct um, all of its activities. But Thank there you. still is a reclamation fund and, um, you know, I, could, I, I, I couldn't tell you how much money's in there, but I still know there is a reclamation fund and it is controlled by Congress. Great. Okay, uh, was the Bureau involved in the Gadsden purchase for more farmland? Pardon me? I'm sorry. Sorry. So was the Bureau involved in the Gadsden purchase for more farmland? Are we are we talking the Gadsden purchase? Yes. Okay, unless I'm wrong or unless I'm misunderstanding the question, the only Gatson purchase I'm aware of occurred after the um, Mexican-American War after 1848. I think it occurred in 1850. Um, and, you know, that's a good 50 years before reclamation is even created. So unless I'm misunderstanding the question, or I'm not familiar with what you're referring to as the Gadsden Purchase. Um, that's the best I can do. Thank you. Okay. As a scholar, what is your opinion of the accuracy of Cadillac Desert? <laughs> I get that question so much. <laughs> Um, first of all, I think Cadillac De Desert is a beautifully written book. Um, I uh, There are some really um, uh, wonderful arguments that are presented in that in that particular book. Um, my my personal feeling on that book is that I have um, I have some issues with the um, the gigantic focus of um, that, you know, water flows to money. Um, as a historian, I have an incredible issue with the lack of documentation of where um, the author gets his facts. Now, I understand that, you know, most of this book was taken from interviews he conducted with folks, um, which is fine. But, you know, there's it's just a lack of footnotes. <laughs> um, you know, that that's all it is. I mean, you know, there's. You know, for me as a historian, those types of things bother me because, you know, there's no way for me to go back and check out where where he got his information. But other than that, I mean, it's a wonderful book. Um, uh, it's a, it's an intriguing read. Um, I would recommend everybody to read it. Just to get that perspective, just to get in a better understanding of water development uh, in the American West. Thank you. Uh, did you state that Japanese American internees worked on reclamation projects? Well, the only one that I know of for sure, um, and it was just for a short time from what I can tell, uh, is that they were uh, called upon to work on the construction of Anderson Ranch Dam in Idaho for just a brief short period of time. Um, most of the records that I've seen 
since for this um, indicate that most of the employment that they had um, was for working in agriculture, um, working on project farms and whatnot. Okay. Can you elaborate on the relationship with Germany and the Grand Valley Roller Dam project? Um, okay, the Grand Valley Roller Dam project. Um, that, what I know about that particular relationship, and once again, this is, you know, um, outside the realm of this presentation, but uh, uh, the Grand Valley Dam was completed in 1916. Uh, the rollers uh, that were used uh, on that dam were uh, were designed were designed in Germany, um, and I'm trying to remember if we actually bought them from Germany, but I can't remember. But I know they're of a German design, um, and. Uh, that's about all I really know about that particular project and those particular um, items. Okay. Do you know if there is a book coming out for the Reclamation 120th birthday? <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I know we're not doing one. Um, we did, you know, as, as as hopefully most of us know, or if you don't, contact me and I will point you in the direction. Um, we did a two-volume set um, to celebrate the 100th anniversary, um, which takes us up to roughly about 2000, uh, the year 2000. Um, but as uh, we have, we have no plans right now to, um, or I have no plans right now to to work on something that would. Um, uh, take us into the to, to the 120th year. Um, I will say that um, I hope to have shortly put up on the uh, history program website. I have updated um, what I, we refer to as um, the brief history of the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, it's, you know, it's a short essay, you know, less than 20 pages, just a, uh, you know, a large overview of the, the history of the Bureau of Reclamation. But I have attempted to, to try to bring that up uh, up to date to, you know, pretty much current activities. Okay. How long did it take to fill Lake Mead? To fill? Yes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, you know, I don't know when, you know, Lake Mead was actually where they actually declared it full. Um, I want to say, you know, and this is just a guess. Um, I was, I want to say it wasn't, I want to say it was before 1940. Um, because, you know, as you know, at that time, Hoover Dam or Boulder Dam, whatever you want to call it at that time, um, was the only dam on the Colorado River, the only storage dam on the Colorado River. So it was taking all the flow um, coming downstream. So, you know, um, as compared to other times, um, it probably wouldn't have taken that long um, to fill the reservoir. But I couldn't, you know, I don't know for sure. I, I can't give you a date. It's a good question, though. Now I'm going to have to go look that up. Thank you. How is Plata River affected by the Missouri project? Did it provide more water to the west? Did it provide more water to the west? Um, what it did um what did it do it ensured that water development and this would be mostly uh mostly in the great plains and the eastern rockies area it ensured that water development would continue um it, it was able to increase water supplies for for irrigation and m and i purposes um so yeah it was yeah 
the short answer to your question is yeah, <laughs> um, it, it did. Um, uh, to a certain extent, it basically it was a like I said, it was a it was a way to supplement our uh, you know irrigated agriculture in those regions um, and uh, ensured the availability of um, of supplies for irrigation purposes. Thank you. Okay, and this is the last question we will have time for. In what ways has reclamation been involved directly with dam construction in other countries? I had heard that reclamation employed at least one worker stationed in mainland China years ago. Um, yeah, I, I, well, yeah, I think I, I talked about that a little bit, but um, any involvement reclamation employees had overseas um were in an advisory role um we as far as i know no reclamation employee oversaw any construction of any facility overseas um we helped out a bunch at being advisors um i know we, there was some work done um in our labs um uh, to um uh, what's the word I'm looking for, to check and verify, you know, the types of facilities design, designed overseas um, would be, would work. Um, so we had, like I said, an advisory, uh, primary and advisory role. Um, um, and like I said, I believe, you know, and I think maybe Rob can help us out a little bit uh, when we get back to him, um, but I'm pretty sure this international stuff uh, aspects of reclamation history are, you know, and it's a fascinating part of it, um, are going to be further explained in one of our later um, presentations. Um, so with that, thank you all for your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. Hopefully we can figure out some way to um, maybe, you know, collate your questions. You can send them to me and maybe I can do my best to, to try to answer them. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Mr. Manning and thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Gahan, and some really good questions as well. Wow. We'll definitely follow up. I know there is, uh, we are planning on a session dealing with international partnerships, so we'll definitely follow up with you. I don't know about you guys, but my pride in the spirit of core is spiking right now. Uh, <laughs> you know, our history is so inspiring and so wonderfully American. I mean, it really is. So uh, the recording of this uh, session uh, will be made available afterwards. Uh, so you'll be able to relive this wonderful experience, our 119th birthday. Thanks again for joining us today to recognize our legacy of professional excellence. And thanks in advance for your continued support of our history series. Again, July is focused on women in reclamation and we'll send you uh, the date and time for that. Uh, and then we'll follow up on the rest of the series as well. Um, and then we're at the start of our planning for our 120th birthday, which will be grand. Remember that it's going to be grand. So stay tuned because you only turn 120 once. So we're going to make sure we do it right. Thanks uh, for all that you do to make Reclamation better. Happy 119th birthday. Please join me in a round of applause for you. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Please take care. <laughs>